Uh, today, I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Travis Baird. Is that right? Yes. yes. That's right. <laughs> uh, Travis is a mindful business coach, speaker, and founder of Mindful Productive, where he helps ambitious professionals to get the clarity, confidence, and control they need to do their best work without burnout or overwhelm. I want to talk about burnout. Um, he lives in San Antonio, Texas with his wife and four cats. That's right. <laughs> you, guys, you guys do um, fostering, right? Oh, uh, we don't currently. Oh, not that's, currently. that's, that's, that's going to happen soon though. Yeah. I have a good friend who fosters in New York and um, she always has lots of kitten pictures. Oh, that's uh, so great. When he's not coaching you, you can find him running on trails, baking bread or playing the viola. Viola? Viola. viola. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did I say that right? You, you got it. I'm obviously not a music person. Well, welcome. Thank you, Jamie. I'm excited to be here. Yay. Uh, so first question is always the same. Uh, what was your first job? Ooh, okay. So my first job was when I was 12 mm-hmm. and I was a soccer referee. Nice. So kind of a weird one, uh, but it actually turned out to be a really useful, valuable experience. So when I was a kid, I played soccer just like a lot of what kids do. Mm-hmm. And so when I turned 12, found out that I could become a referee and make some money. <laughs> and so I started doing that while I was also playing. So basically every weekend I would play with my team and then I would ref three, four, five, six soccer games on top of that. So a long lot. Saturday. <laughs> and then um, I actually did that all the way through high school until oh, wow. I left for college. And um, it was great. I mean, as a soccer referee, as you guys anybody who's listening who's ever been to a sporting event or been a parent of a child at a, at a recreational sporting event, um, the referees are not very well-liked people. <laughs> <laughs> so what that meant was that from a, a very young age, I got a lot of experience making decisions really quickly under mm-hmm. pressure and having at least half the people there not liking that decision. Um, so <laughs> the ability to just kind of stand with that and, mm-hmm. and whatever the decision was, be able to move forward. Um, was really valuable, actually. I, I think I didn't appreciate that at the time, but but looking back now, as we're talking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, that was actually really helpful. Um, I'm glad my parents encouraged me to do that. That's awesome. And so, like, it probably translates to what you do now, because you're like telling people what to do, and they may not like it, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, definitely in terms of my coaching business, mm-hmm. like the ability to to make decisions quickly, the ability to see what's happening clearly. I think those are skills that kind of first started developing in that refing life. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, being able to, obviously, anytime you own your own business, you face people who don't love what you have to say or don't like exactly the way you do things. So learning how to, how to cope with that, obviously, that's a lifelong process for most of us, but, mm-hmm. but it definitely helped. I love it. I love it. Um, I don't know if you follow Glennon Doyle. Do you know who that is? I don't. Um, she's actually married to Abby Wambach. Okay. Um, awesome. And so she did, because the women's national team played yesterday, um, she did like a soccer, like a soccer primer for people. And she knows like nothing about soccer. And so she's holding up these cards and explaining offsides. And she's like, offsides, (laughs) that means after all of that, no goal. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, but you might be asking me, what does offsides actually mean? And I would say to you, we don't know. And it's not for us to know. <laughs> that is, that is a good way to describe and it. And I was dying of laughter. So I played lacrosse. Okay. So like, I never played little kid soccer. My parents really never put us in, um, really. I was just like, I'm playing, I just played lacrosse in high school and the rules are kind of similar to soccer. So like, I do kind of understand offsides, but I also was a defenseman. So it's like, yeah. I still exactly. don't later get you don't have, you don't have to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> off signs means no goal. After all that, no goal. Okay. That's all you need to know. It's just, it's coming back. <laughs> um, so your background is in music. Um, what was that progression like? You have a doctorate? Yes, I have a doctorate yeah, in music. That's a lot of school. Yeah. So let's see. Around the same time that I started soccer refereeing, actually, mm-hmm. I also started on the viola, mm-hmm. which for anybody listening, viola is like a violin. You hold it the same way, but it's a little bigger, a little longer. Bigger. 
a little bigger okay. and deeper sound. It's objectively better, uh, <laughs> if you ask me. Um, but, so if you in have, my personal opinion, <laughs> in my personal opinion, it's objectively better. Um, so obviously, if you ever have family members, kids who are interested mm -hmm. in taking up a string instrument, highly recommend the viola. Um, so Good around job. that time, I started playing the viola and. As I got toward the end of my high school career, I, I realized that I really wanted to study music uh, in, in college. And um, so I applied to be a music major. And so I, I did that, got a scholarship to go to a state school. And toward the end of my time in my undergraduate degree, I was like, man, I really like this stuff. I think I wanna do more, but I don't really know what yet. And so my teacher and several other mentors were like, okay, just do a master's degree then. So, <laughs> so just <Okay>. like that, <laughs> just like that, I um, applied to a whole bunch of different schools, actually did auditions around the country at seven different schools um, and ended up getting accepted to a conservatory where I then went for my next degree. And there I had a really crucial experience, which was that I started struggling a lot with performance anxiety, stage fright. Mm -hmm. Uh, which for a musician is not very fun. <laughs> um, basically, I would I would get on stage and and just immediately I would start shaking. My hands would shake. Um, I would start fearing mistakes. It, I would I'd play a lot from memory, so I'd worried that I would forget stuff. Um, the reality was I was always really well prepared because I was a perfectionist, mm -hmm. but I was I was constantly terrified. So like my mental experience was bad, even though the performance itself was usually pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, so. Because of that, um, I started really avoiding performing. And so I, I talked to my teacher and was like, you know, I gotta, I have to do something about this or, or I, I'm gonna have to figure something out. And she's, she pointed me in the direction of, of yoga practice and meditation, oh, wow. which I, I was very thankful for. Um, so my first yoga class, I don't know, Jamie, do you, have you ever practiced yoga at all or gone to a yoga class? Yeah, I'm a yogi. Okay, awesome. So <laughs> I don't know what your first yoga class is like, but my first yoga class was a disaster. <laughs> I barely made it through. I went to a class that I should not have gone to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I barely made it through without throwing up. Mm -hmm. But there was the opening of a door for me, which was that I started gaining some new physical awareness. Mm -hmm. And from there, some new mental awareness that like there was a lot going on beneath the surface that I was just not aware of, um, particularly like self-judgment, negative self-talk, all of the stuff around perfectionism, mm -hmm. you know, not being good enough. So as I started exploring that, I really got into yoga because like a lot of people, I wasn't good at it at first. So I was like, okay, I got to do this more. Right. Um, but it's non-competitive, right? It's not competitive, right. No, I, I didn't say I went into it with the right attitude, but <laughs> that's where I was. Um, so I uh, got really immersed in it and ended up becoming a registered yoga teacher and advanced trainings in yoga and meditation. And that is what, it actually led to a really big shift in how I approached playing the viola. My, it, it helped me a lot with my stage fright and just my whole attitude around performing. So then as I finished my master's degree, I went to my teacher and was like, okay, I think I want to teach college. So she's like, okay, you got to go get a doctorate then. <laughs> so I did that. And um, as, oh, the, cool. yeah, basically toward, it was a lot of school. Um, towards the end of my doctorate, I decided to develop a study for my dissertation looking at how meditation and visualization relates to performance anxiety based on the experience I had, based on the approach that I had developed for myself. And that study went really well, turned into several um, conference presentations later. But as I got close to finishing my doctorate, and this is something that if you ever talk to anybody else who's done this, maybe you have on, on the show, mm -hmm. um, sometimes when you get close to that end of your, your time in graduate school and you start looking at, okay, what's life in academia going to look like? What happened to me was I realized I didn't want that life. Um, and that's probably, that might be a topic for a different time. We can talk about it now if you want, but <laughs> it might be a topic for a different time. Um, but I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be uh, involved in, in that life anymore for, for a number of reasons. So as soon, like, as soon as I graduated, I started my own business. Um, and actually, I guess now we're getting ahead of ourselves. So that, that was my life in music. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that was when I started my first business, um, which was working exclusively with musicians and music teachers mm -hmm. around uh, stage fright and around um, uh, de dealing with overwhelm and burnout. Working mostly one-on-one -on -one people, but I developed a few group courses right off the bat, which is not really the right way to do things, but I did it anyway and it was fine. <laughs> and no um, yeah, it, it, was, it was valuable experience. Um, so that was, yeah, that was kind of where that started. And, and 
I love it. So, so go ahead and tell me why you didn't want to do academia that I'm actually, can, I'm actually <laughs> interested in that. Okay. So for me, um, there are a number of things and one of them is that when you, when you're, at, when you're a professor, um, mm -hmm. which is what I was aiming to become, you have, um, a set of circumstances that you have very little control over. And in terms of your ability to um, improve your circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, being very vague here, <laughs> but in terms of your ability to improve those, it often requires like just getting another job. Like you just right. have to move. You, you can't really improve your situation. There's not really a way to negotiate very effectively. Um, now getting into stuff that's, that's a lot more controversial and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll touch the surface and if we want to go deeper, we can. Um, it's totally fine. I just, I'm just interested because it's, it's not something I have a whole lot of experience with. Yeah. Well, in, in music, for music school, um, and this is, of course, not the case everywhere, mm -hmm. but in a lot of state schools, basically, it's set up in a way that the, the system is bringing in tons of students every year, right? Mm -hmm just like a lot of universities. Mm -hmm. And in, in music schools, they, they need to have those students in order to fill their ensemble so that they can have a symphony and a band and a choir and all that, mm -hmm. which means that you have to bring in a certain number of students. That number of students doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the number of like reasonable jobs that will proceed after that for those mm -hmm. students, which is not to say that music school isn't a good place for these people to go. It's just the training right now is very much for how to become a band director or orchestra director, or choir director, how to become a um, professional musician in an orchestra. And those jobs exist, but they're not growing <laughs> right now. And they don't pay a lot. And they don't pay a ton. Yeah, unless you're in a top five orchestra, they don't pay mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. or, or becoming a, a music professor. Um, so there are opportunities for musicians to create their own businesses, to develop really cool new projects, to create new ensembles. And there are some people doing that now. Yeah. But music school in general right now doesn't teach to those things. It teaches to the old way of doing things. And it's not teaching to small business ownership. It's not. Very, very few places are. Some, some new programs are coming up around this, but it's That's good. on the whole, it's a problem. And so I knew that I didn't want to be a part of that old system and yeah. didn't want to be a part of continuing that. That makes sense. Yeah, we actually, I have a client um, who, uh, they do music lessons, basically. Yeah. It's just a whole bunch of people doing music lessons. Um, and the amount of work they do, and like, it's just, and there's no business acumen there. Um, you know, like, they're doing well for not having any business acumen, but you know, there's a lot of stuff that I'm just like, what is going on? Like, <laughs> guys, we gotta do this and this, and we gotta set up proper businesses, and like, we gotta do the thing, because there's just nothing really around that. And the people that are teaching are all 1099. And like, it's just, you know, it's like, this is what they have, you know, yeah. is just to teach, which I'm sure many of them love to do. But it's just very interesting to me to see all these like highly degreed people, you know, making 15 bucks an hour teaching. Exactly. Eight year olds, how to, you know, do their scales. Like, yeah, is that what you wanted, you know, like it's right. hard. <laughs> You know, I feel like, <laughs> what can we do for you? How can we make this better? Exactly. And that's the thing. There are, there are models. There are ways to do that, to teach, to teach privately, to teach independently mm -hmm. of a school and to make a lot of money and mm -hmm. to like have a business that's set up in a way that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that most music schools just don't teach any of those skills. Um, yeah. Some do. I was very lucky to have a few teachers who helped me with that. And that's why mm -hmm. I was able to start my own business when I started mm -hmm. or when I finished school. Mm -hmm. But I also went through three degrees. Yeah. <laughs> I, right? I, <laughs> you a long time in school. <laughs> you had the best odds. <laughs> exactly. I had the best odds. Um, yeah. I think that happens uh, in a lot of different industries, though, mm -hmm. too. I mean, I can't say that accounting school taught me how to run a business. Yeah. Like, that's not true. Um, and I was just talking to a friend of mine that's a vet. Um, and she was like, we had one class and most vets go to start their own businesses. Um, and I think that's very true for dental schools too. And most dentists go and start their own businesses, chiropractors, like there's tons of different industries where really you go to start your own business and they're not teaching people anything about business. Right. Well, I think that's where a big, a big part of the disconnect is happening now is how, how do we talk about the next generation going to college and make that a, an experience that actually benefits them long term. Right. Like, it could be done. It's it wouldn't. It doesn't take a huge drastic change to make that work a lot better than it is mm -hmm. now. 
but a lot of places are just we're we're stuck. It's it's a little behind the times right now. As, yeah. as more and more people are becoming entrepreneurs and starting their own businesses, basically every field needs to teach something to that, and that needs to be required and not optional. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I even went to business school, and I yeah. I can tell you, I didn't really learn anything in there. That I mean, other than how to do the accounting pieces, that was actually applicable to business today. You know. That was 18 years ago, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little while ago, but still. Still. <laughs> All right. Next question. Um, so that's okay. So you went from your doctorate to performance coaching. Yes. And, th- and that's the first business you started was working with performers. Yes. Awesome. So you currently, so what you do now is called Mindful Productive. Uh, what is your definition of mindfulness? Okay, that is a great question and one that I love answering. So thank okay. you for asking. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm curious. <laughs> so mindfulness for me, I, I choose a simple route for this. Um, mm-hmm. There, are, there's obviously a lot of depth here, but for me, mindfulness is the. It's simply being aware in the present moment, mm-hmm. practicing non-judgment. Okay, I like that. I like so. That. Yeah, it's nice. And the the applications for that are really limitless. I mean, mindfulness can be used in the context that a lot of us encounter it the first time, which is in meditation, mm-hmm. um, where that's kind of a specific practice you do. Mm-hmm. Or it can be practiced in any activity that we do in any part of our lives. And obviously, part a big part of what I do is now helping people apply mindfulness to their business lives. I love that. Because that's where there's so much benefit. Possible. So how do you teach others to be mindful? That's that's, that's a serious question for me because I was just like, how would, how would I help somebody be more mindful? Yeah. So a lot of that centers around developing habits that, that make that possible. Because okay. a lot of us, I mean, and this was me too, when I was first trying to figure all this stuff out for myself, mm-hmm. a lot of us, we just get up. And especially if you run your own business or if you have uh, an independent, anything independent, or even if you have a job, it doesn't really matter. A lot of us just get up. And we go from point A to point B without thinking about it. We just do. We just do the thing. And the whole idea of multitasking and hustling and moving as fast as possible, these are really ingrained culturally for us, whether or not we want to do those things. We just, we do. We have this pressure to do as much as possible, as quickly as possible Mm -hmm. as a culture. Um, So a large part of helping someone to become more mindful starts from, okay, well, first seeing that that's occurring and like understanding, okay, what are the ways in which I do these things that undermine my ability to be aware of what's going on? Mm -hmm. And then developing the simplest possible practices that allow you to start opening that door. Like it doesn't start with an hour of meditation every day. It starts with a breath. It starts with, you know, a few moments in the morning before you start to just like get centered. It doesn't have to be huge. But as you start making those positive changes and as you start, as you continually positively reinforce those for yourself, Mm -hmm. then it just starts to roll on its own. But it takes starting it and really getting that, those first few steps moving forward to make that possible. Okay, awesome. I love that. Um, So it's just a habit. Yeah. I love it. Um, (laughs) I'm just making notes for myself as we go here. Um, So how do, how can someone use mindfulness to be more productive? Yeah, so uh, an example that I like to give is, you know, 2.30 in the afternoon. We're recording this in the afternoon. So mm-hmm, you sure. this right before, right after, depending on when you're listening to this. Um, so it's, it's in the afternoon and you are in that, we all have our rhythms. So mm-hmm. let's, whatever time is your slump. And, but you know, you have to get work done, right? So mm-hmm. um, you're in a place where you need to get a project finished. You've got a deadline. You need to get something out the door. But as you're trying to focus to work, the only thing that keeps happening is you keep thinking of other things to, th- to either think about or focus on, or you just want to go check Facebook again or mm-hmm. scroll through Instagram for a while or anything else sounds useful. And so in those moments, this is actually a really useful place to start with mindfulness is that when those moments happen, it's actually, instead of forcing yourself to work, mm-hmm. it's a matter of just pausing for a moment. So like rather than kind of naturally spinning into clicking over to Facebook or like clicking over to something else that's not the thing that I need to focus on. Just taking a moment and saying, okay, I'm going to pause. I'm going to step back. I'm going to look away from my screens for a second and eyes open or closed. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Just take a minute to breathe and notice what's there and just notice what I'm experiencing. 
And that can take 10 seconds or 30 seconds, or you can take five minutes, you can take two hours, it doesn't matter. Um, but even in just a few seconds, just having that moment of space can allow you to say, okay, what's, what am I experiencing? What do I need right now? Like at the core of this is what do I need right now? And in that place, it's much easier to say, okay, I know what it is. It's this thing, it's this one thing, and I know how to prioritize that. And now I'm going to set my intention to do that. And the nice thing is too, that if you are really sleepy or like really exhausted and you need to take a break, we all have to take breaks sometimes. So in that moment of space, if the thing that's constantly coming up is, I need to stand up and walk around. I haven't moved all day. Or like, I need to go sit on the couch for a second if you work from home. Um, or I need to go for a walk outside or I need to anything else. Then in that moment, you can say, okay, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take five minutes. And like that five minutes is going to be worthwhile because I'm going to get this thing that I need and then I'm going to be able to come back. Rather than being stuck in a constant state of just flowing from one thing to the next and not being able to come back. I love that. I love that a lot. I spend a lot of time distracting myself. <laughs> From we, what needs to happen. <laughs> um, it's actually funny. So I was I was started preparing for the podcast with you yesterday, and I literally was sitting here like falling asleep. Uh-huh. And I, so I love how you're like, go lay on the couch. So I did. I went and I laid on the couch. I took like a thirty minute just snoo, like just closed my eyes because like obviously you're tired if you're falling asleep. I was like, do I need to walk outside or do I need a nap? And I was like, yeah. I need a nap. That's awesome. And then when you came back, was it, it was better, right? Yeah, it was better. Um, <laughs> but I have these days where I just am like, I cannot sit in front of that computer any longer, you know? And I'm just like, okay, what do I need to do with myself? Do I need to go work out? Do I need to go, you know, what do I need to do so that I can come back? Yeah. Uh, no, and that's great. I mean, the fact that you ask yourself that question is mm-hmm. like, that is like the core. That's the start. Like that is building awareness of what's there. Most of us, a even, I mean, even me, I do this professionally. And like, there are some days where I don't check in either. And we push away the signals that our body and our minds and our emotions and everything else are giving us. Mm-hmm. And we ignore them. And that is only to our detriment. So we're more exhausted later. Exactly. It doesn't help to push through those. Obviously, there are times and places to push through. Mm-hmm. Those, are, those are special. Uh, they do happen. But it, it, if that's every day, if that's your normal state of being, then even just adding in a little bit of noticing a little more, noticing, having a little more awareness, and then honoring that 1% of the time, that will be a, an improvement and you'll feel a difference. And, I really love that. Yeah. I really love that. I need to do more of that. Um, okay, so you work with high achievers, um, either one-on-one or in teams all the time. What do you find to be the greatest thief of productivity um, and creator of stress for people? The greatest thief? Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, for, it's really for thief and creator of stress, it's the same thing, which is just feeling overwhelmed, Mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously a broad thing. So I'll I'll narrow it down a little bit. Um, The feeling of overwhelm that comes from expectations that don't align with reality. Okay. So I'll I'll describe that a little bit. Love that. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So a lot of times, um, like say, say today I woke up and I said, okay, and I've got this, this interview with Jamie today, mm-hmm. and I've got these five other things that I'm going to focus on. These are the projects I'm going to work on. And then on top of that, I also want to do these 10 other things and then these 15 other things. So like I've got this giant long to-do list. Then I've basically, at the start of the day, created an expectation that my success will be based on finishing all of those things. Then as I go through the day, I'm constantly going back to that and saying, okay, how am I doing? Am I getting close to that? Am I going to achieve it? Or if, if I'm like some days, I'm trying to ignore it because I know I'm not moving fast enough on those things. Mm-hmm. So then the end of the day comes and I just feel like another failure and like it was a lost day. Even if I did 15 things, even if I did a bunch of really important things, I didn't get all of it done. And I, I left all of these things left to do. And so all of that was because of an expectation that I set and I chose to set when I started the day. Um, And that also leads to tons of overwhelm during the day because there's this feeling of I have to move faster, I have to do more, I have to do two things at once. Mm -hmm. So the way to help with that, one of the ways to help with that, there are lots, but the way to start with this is to just start by finding a way to set more reasonable expectations for yourself and for your own work, regardless of what area you work in. And so that can look like, okay, at the start of each day, what's the one important thing? Like, what's, what's the one important thing that I want to make sure I get to today? And like, writing it down helps a lot because then when you can scratch it off at the end of the day, you, you can pat yourself on the back. Feels good. <laughs> Feels good. Um, 
And then, and then from there, whatever other um, systems you use to organize the, thing, the tasks that you do each day, which these, that's one of my favorite topics, mm -hmm. um, then whatever you use to do that, making sure that those expectations you set for the day and for the week are reasonable. It might not, you might not get to all of it, but that it's not so far outside that it, it would, is not possible for anybody. Um, right. In the best circumstances. A really good friend of mine um, who, who's um, ADHD and talks about it all the time is like, I have, I can do 10 things a day total. Like, and that includes getting myself dressed. That includes, you know, brushing teeth, like whatever, you know, whatever her 10 things are, she needs to make sure she builds in the things that like have to get done on top of like the things she wants to get done so that she, so by the time she gets the things she wants to do she hasn't exhausted herself with the things she has to do she has to do so i just it's very interesting and i was talking to another friend of mine about she does the top six i don't know if you oh yeah uh -huh. you guys it's something you work with yeah. um you know those top six things you have to get done that day um but that's a doable amount yeah right like exactly yeah the top six handle six it's not uh, build a website. Like build a website is not number one in the top six. Like they're, they're reasonable things. Yeah. Right. I love it. I love that. Yeah. Cause I, I was, um, so another productivity coach that I work with, he really loves calendaring and block calendaring. Um, and so I'm trying really, really hard this week to, um, to actually calendar what happened mm. instead of what I wanted to happen. Yeah. And to be very honest about what I did with my time. Like I have like an hour yesterday where I was just like interacting with my, um, my staff tax person. Like we were talking about, you know, a client and billing them and like how we were going to do this and what the project was going to look like. And literally was like an hour of time, mm -hmm. but now we know how we're going to handle it. It's ready to go. It wasn't on my list of stuff to do though. So I needed to move stuff around or move it down, down the road <laughs> uh, because that ended up being one of my six Yeah. or whatever. I yeah, I, I love I love that idea. I mean, but what you just described is when I when I work with my clients on this thing, which some of them, some people really love this, and some people it's like the most horrible thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I don't make everybody do this, but I, I like to call it a time audit, which mm -hmm. you know I, I know you you like that. Uh, like the word audit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so a time audit where you're basically just saying, okay, what's happening, mm -hmm. but not in the future. Like what what happened today? Looking mm -hmm. back, mapping it out, having a calendar because that gives you a level of awareness and this gets back to mindfulness and uh, non-judgmental awareness. You can look back and say, okay, this is what happened. I have this thing, you know, I, I can see it. And I will naturally have emotions about what I see about, you know, oh, this isn't good enough. Right, I didn't yeah. work hard enough. I didn't work enough time. But then being able to see that and say, okay, I'm going to let that go and then use that to say, all right, I have this awareness now. How can I use that awareness to make a plan for the next week? Mm -hmm. And it's just constant, like small improvements. And those add up so much over time. Uh, a lot of people try, one of the biggest other mistakes that people make is they try to do these huge overhauls overnight. And I've done that trying so many to, times. <laughs> <laughs> me too. No, I'm, And I just scrap it. I'm like, forget it. Yeah. No, my journey into this, because I obviously, because I do this professionally, I, I love productivity. I love thinking about time mm -hmm. management, all that stuff. So when I was younger, but way before I was ever thinking about doing it professionally, I would consume and just like try all these different things. And so I would do these giant overhauls. I would do this, you know, 180 degree turn overnight. You know, now I'm using this whole system and I have to track it every five minutes. And I'm, or now I'm doing only Pomodoro or now I'm only doing bullet journal and Asana, whatever. Um, and the thing that happens is we spend so much time on the the system and the the way it works mm -hmm. that it's not sustainable over over a long period of time and these giant changes are really they're exciting for some of us <laughs> but it's very unsettling too and it makes it really hard to do work in that space so i like to focus on small changes small changes that are really valuable and then compounding those over time in a way that the core the core stuff that you learn allows everything else to happen and to where you can become your own best teacher at the end of it. Like that's the goal. I love that. Um, so I, my next question was, uh, what are your favorite tools to lead, uh, to teach people that can immediately impact their lives and productivity? So yeah. Great little <laughs> question. Yeah, no, there, there are a few really good ones um, that I, I start with almost all of my clients. And one is 
how do you start your work each day? So mm -hmm. I like to talk about morning routines, not so much in the space of what do you do from the time you wake up to where you start working. Um, those are really great. And I, it's good to have morning routines like that. Those are awesome. But when I work on this, I like to talk about, okay, what do you do between the time that you enter your office and you actually start your first work task? Uh, most people, there's no space between those two things. Nope. <laughs> Book it up and start doing emails. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's that's the exact example I was going to give because that's what almost everybody does is is they they roll into their office, pop open their computer, and they start responding to emails right away. Mm -hmm. And there's a pressure to do that because especially if you run your own business, there's a feeling of like I have to respond to this stuff quickly. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you do that, and Jamie, I mean, you can tell me what this is like for you, but what happens to a lot of people I talk to about this is that they, they roll into it. And if there's a lot of emails, then that might mean they're stuck in email land for a long time. They're spending a lot of their best energy on responding to emails, which are usually low energy tasks or, or mm -hmm. ideally would be. Um, and then from there, they just roll into the next, the next thing, the next task on the list without ever actually making a plan or a set of goals for the day or any idea of like what's actually important to me today. It's just, mm -hmm. this is at the top of my email inbox. It's marked urgent. So I got to do this. Um, so there's a state of, of real urgency and, and that over time, adding that up can lead to burnout pretty quickly. Um, so I really like using morning routines. I have a couple that I recommend. One is just taking time and, and I won't teach it right now, but I'll, I'll give you the, the broad strokes of it okay. where it takes less than five minutes. You're basically sitting down and before you start working, just going through a centering breathing practice. So mm -hmm. having a chance to get engaged with your body and breathing, deep breathing has been shown to help actually physically relax the body and set up mm -hmm. a, a place of focus. Then from there, moving into a brief mindfulness meditation to build awareness and then to come back to focus. So you see what's going on before you ever start working. And then from there, rolling into um, a question meditation, getting back to the question we asked earlier, which is, what do I need right now? What do I need right now? Before you even start working, before you open the emails for the first time to say, what do I need right now? Um, a client I was working with recently, she described this, she was saying, you know, most days I'm just constantly asking myself, um, what task should I be working on? Mm -hmm. Like, what task should I be working on? What task should I be working on? And that's what a lot of us do, um, if we're even thinking about that, if we're not just trying to distract ourselves. Um, so really, so that's usually step one for people. This is really step zero. This is the step that needs to happen before that step. If you want to make a good decision on what to focus on, what to do, then asking yourself, what do I need right now? will illuminate that. And there are no mm -hmm. wrong answers for that question. Um, I love that. Yeah. Cool. And it's like five minutes. You're yeah, not it, like yeah, you're five minutes. Eight steps in like five hours. No, exactly. Yeah, okay. it takes, that takes five minutes. I mean, if the first few times you do it, it might take seven or eight minutes. Okay. You get used to it. Um, but that process takes five minutes or less. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes there's, you know, some days you'll do it and you'll be like, wow, that was weird. I don't know what I got out of that. And, but it will still have been useful because you'll have gotten the physical benefit of breathing. But most days in my experience and with the clients I've, I've taught this to, and I've not taught this to a lot of people in workshops too, most people write me back later and they're like, okay, I wasn't so sure about that, but I started doing it. And now I feel so much calmer when I start my work day. And I find that I'm actually prioritizing things whereas before I wasn't. Um, so those seem to be the real benefits for, for most folks that use those. Just that simple five minutes tool. I love it. Yeah. That's so great. So that's your number one favorite tool. Yes, number one. And and for anybody who's listening, I have a I'll, I'll gladly share that with you. You can get a free download of that. Yes, awesome. <laughs> uh, and we're gonna link that in the description box for everybody. Perfect. Um, as a website, right? Yes, the website. Yeah, I was on there earlier today. Um, yeah, the email thing, man. Those those that email can run your life. I tell you what, I've uh, I'm I'm in box zero. I okay. finally got to inbox zero and I did that by just moving everything to an archive folder and like maybe someday I'm going to need this stuff, but probably not. Probably not. <laughs> um, and then I try to do email twice a week, twice a day. I've got a calendar. Um, so I try to not let the email run me. I run it. Um, but sometimes it just happens it because it's easier to do that than to focus on other stuff sometimes. Yes. Oh my gosh. Sorry. <laughs> You just hit on a huge <laughs> this is a thing too that comes up so often, which is mm -hmm. that it's often when we're facing resistance, which if you do any kind of work that's challenging um, mm -hmm. or, or requires effort, which we, everybody listening to this, um, then, exactly, then 
you'll face resistance at some point. And when that resistance hits, a lot of times what happens is we just look to the easiest possible solution, which if there's an email that just popped up, that's usually the easiest. Um, so, you know, being able to see that resistance, that's part of having a mindfulness practice, having awareness, and then being able to know what to do when you run into it, which is often to say, okay, I need to choose how to refocus here. It's always a choice. I mean, you can, you can do your email, like whatever works for you is fine. Um, there are lots of different ways to approach that, but making sure that in each moment you know how to choose for you, for your business, for your life, that's really the key practice that, that we always keep coming back to. I love that. It's just like no, no option is a bad option yeah. if you're choosing it. Exactly. If you're choosing it intentionally. Yeah. I love that. Um, so you help people avoid burnout. What is the biggest skill people need to... Um, I cannot read my own, my own line. Oh, here, that's what it says. Uh, okay, so you help people avoid burnout. What is the biggest skill people need to um, preserve their energy? Hmm. That's, that's a, man, such a good question. And, and it's a big one. Um, it's a big one. It's a sneakily big one. But um, <laughs> so the, one of the most important things you can do, if you are on the edge of burnout, or if you think you might be approaching burnout, mm -hmm. One of the most valuable things you can do is to find some small way, any small way, to prioritize your needs. Um, and I say that, it sounds really, if you're not in a state of burnout, this is going to sound so trite and obvious. But if you've ever been there, you know how easy it is to just meet other people's needs, meet other people's deadlines, agree to whatever anybody else asks you to do. That's more important than what I need. Mm -hmm. So some ways to do that, the skills, the skills that go into that are first having awareness, being able to see, okay, I see the signs of burnout for me, which for me, those are usually I start feeling exhausted all the time, like all the time, all the time. And the things that usually excite me about my work don't anymore. Mm -hmm. Then there's a level of cynicism that starts to creep in. Like I like to be friendly and nice and those things go in the trash can. <laughs> um, I find myself getting more judgmental and frustrated and angry at things. And then the third thing is obviously that the efficacy of my work starts decreasing. Like if you've ever been in that place where you start making a lot of mistakes and you're like, what, what the hell? Why am I making mistakes? Mm -hmm. um, April that, first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. April first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, those, those are for me, those are my big signs of burnout. And when I see those, like building in that knowledge of, okay, this is what they usually are. Mm -hmm. Then when they pop up, I can see them more quickly. And then the skills are, okay, how can I prioritize either reducing my load just a tiny bit? Is there anything I can give to someone else? Is there anything like work-wise that I can give to somebody else? Is there any work that I can let go for now, say no to, or shut down for a bit? For me in, in coaching, that's not usually an option, but depending on your business, that might be sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, or like, what are some things around, I know for a lot of, a lot of my clients are, are, are women, happen to be women. And if you're, if you're a mom if you, and you run your own business, then if you can get some support, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, if you can get any kind of support, whether that's hiring a housekeeper, mm -hmm. even just a little bit, just a tiny mm -hmm. bit, or um, finding a way to get support on cooking or, um, you know, other household stuff that we don't normally think of when we think of work burnout. Mm -hmm. They can create a little space or a way to, and this is a big one, prioritize like some small amount of self-care. Mm -hmm. Like, and when I say small, I mean really small. A lot of times people, when they think of self-care, they think of, oh, I have to go to the spa or I have to go to a yoga class or whatever. I have to I spend to money. The weekend in Mexico. <laughs> exactly. The weekend in Mexico, which all those things are awesome. <laughs> Do those things, go for it. Um, but if you can't, and if that's not really where you're at, then there are lots of small ways to practice self-care. Just, just taking breaks is a way to practice self-care. Taking, taking a nap during the day is a way to practice self-care. If you're, if you're in a business where you can do that, which Jamie, you did that, and I just want to give you a giant high five for that. We're high-fiving if you're listening and not watching the video. Um, so, you know, stuff like that. There's also, um, you know, just creating boundaries around your workday. So like, if you don't have boundaries around your workday, like what day does the work, what time does the workday end? Mm -hmm. if you usually work till super late. Being able to say, so okay, true. today, my workday is going to end at fill in the blank, whatever that is for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you like to cook, for me, I usually like to cook dinner. So if I can, I will start my workday earlier so that I can end my workday 
when it's time to cook dinner. Um, that's just, that works for me. Don't, that doesn't mean anybody else has to do that, but that's one that I use. Mm -hmm. um, also, I love self-massage as self-care, like mm -hmm. literally just giving your shoulders a massage, giving mm -hmm. your neck a massage. It's so tiny, but it allows you to reconnect with your body. Um, there are lots of things you can do, infinite things you can do. I love that. And um, I have a I have a really good friend who practices a lot of tough love. Um, mm -hmm. and so like that's her shtick um, and she's really, really good at it. Um, and she talks about like making that dentist appointment you've been holding off on for the last 10 years or whatever, that's self-care. Like making that phone call that has been looming over you is self-care. Absolutely. You know, yeah, it doesn't I'm have actually... to be a weekend at the spa. It doesn't have to be any of those things. It has to be that stuff on your list that's really, really hard for you to do. Doing those things can be self-care. Yes. Yeah, Janie, that man, that's a good point. And I, I had forgotten to include that. Like that, that is a crucial thing, which is that for some circumstances and some, mm -hmm. depending on yeah. what your life is like, yeah, yeah, just, um, there, there are times where doing work is self-care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Instagram influencers don't, will not agree with this, but, but it absolutely is. If there is a task that has been looming over you and causing you mental anguish for mm -hmm. weeks or months or years, yeah. then if there's a way to get enough clarity and to create enough space to do that thing, and it might require a lot, if it's been causing a holdup, you might need to clear a lot of space to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you can find a way to make that happen, then it will allow you to then, one, clear, clear the way, clear the space mm -hmm. where the, that was already holding up. But then that will allow you to spend all that energy and focus and continually getting reminded of it Mm -hmm. on the things that really matter to you, whether that's work or play or going on vacation to Mexico. <laughs> I love um, that. Whatever it is. Sometimes it's a, it's a decision too, like a decision you haven't made. Oh yeah. Like a lot of the time. <laughs> especially yeah. for us small business owners, like we only have so much bandwidth a lot of the time. And so stuff sits on the back burner, um, like things we want to change in our business or, um, you know, certificates we want to do or learning we want to do or the, that client we want to go after or that niche we want to pick. I mean, there's just, those are just my examples. Those are just yeah. my things. <laughs> um, you know, it just sits because we could very easily just be in the weeds all the time. Right. Well, and that decision fatigue causes so much, in, like loses so much energy on its own, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Either, yeah. You know, your tax person, you might need to call. <laughs> right. Anybody? Do you need to call me? <laughs> Advertise that. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, that decision making process is, is often part of this level of awareness. Like once you, a lot of times when I, when I start working with people on building awareness, mm -hmm. they realize all this stuff that's been lurking, that's been secretly causing a lot of turmoil. Mm -hmm. And that moment can be a little bit intense because you realize, oh man, I have been thinking about like, I didn't realize it, but I had been worrying about the dentist or my tax, calling my tax person. Uh, so when you create that space, like the ability to then choose how to, how to deal with those is the next skill to have. And from the way I like to approach it is to just simply break it into, is it now or is it later? Um, and there are lots of ways to track this kind of stuff, but if it is a, if it's a now thing, like if you realize there's something that's been looming, a decision you've been needing to make, mm -hmm that's been looming for a long time, then like if it's a niche or if it's a direction you wanna go in your business, a new project you wanna pursue, then you can say, okay, is this a now thing? Is this something I need to do right now? And if it is, then that's awesome, <laughs> go for it. Figure out a way to make it work. If it is not, whether it's a tomorrow thing or a next week or a next year thing, then find a way to capture that, whether that's writing it down in a journal or uh, in a Google doc or whatever, whatever like you like to use. Um, and then, so you, you have it, you still have it to come back to. And I, I, I like to teach systems on how to deal with this too, but then you're able to decide, okay, if I'm coming back to it later, then I am going to write it down. I'm going to let it be over here and then I'm going to let it go. Um, so even if I'm going to make that decision tomorrow, I'm not going to think about it today. And that's an intentional choice that I'm making. Um, yeah. And it can be as simple as that. Yeah. I've tabled it. It's not for today. Exactly. Awesome. I love that. Okay. Um, okay. Before I ask my last question, um, what is the easiest way for people to find you? Ooh, okay. So my website is mindfulproductive.com. And it'll be in the description boxes. Oh yeah. You got it. And yeah. um, I recently started Instagram. So I have an Instagram account that's doing, it's so cool. It's so fun. Um, <laughs> so that's at mindfulproductive. If you'd like to, if you're on IG. Cool. Um, yeah. That's the easiest thing I think. Awesome. All right. Last question for you. 
Um, what is the one thing every person should be doing to be more productive in your opinion? Mm. That's a good one. So I believe that every person should start the day with some level of clarity. So creating that space intentionally, and it takes a little discipline to start out, but really creating that space intentionally to start the day and finding a space where you can both feel centered and focused and mm -hmm. get to a place of like a good baseline mm -hmm. <laughs> where you're calm. And then to be able to make decisions on what's most important for the day. What are my, what, what events do I have going on today? What are my top actions? Whether you're using top six or another system, mm -hmm. what are they gonna be? And then how am I gonna end the day? It's like a lot of, a lot of small business owners don't think about the end of the day until the end of the day arrives. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the day, if you start that with clarity, you can say, okay, I'm gonna finish when either this thing is done or when, I, when this time is reached or whatever it is. Um, having that allows you to then, when it's over, you finish and you separate and you walk away. And that creates so much more safety for your own mental health around work-life balance, but also mm -hmm. for your family. <laughs> they will thank you for it. Um, so it all comes down to how you start your work day. Like what, is, what does that look like? And I highly recommend breathing, meditation, having a moment where you ask yourself what's most important and then setting a set of priorities. I love that. I love the bound, like their safeties and boundaries. Like we say this with kids all the time. Like I know you guys, you don't have kids, but I have kids and we talk about like parenting and how that works and all the things. And it's like, there's safety and boundaries. Like people are happy and wonderful when they know where the beginning and end are. Yeah. And they know what boundary is going to smack them back into line. Um, so I love that the idea of like, when, when does my day end? Um, yeah. Because it can bleed out oh, for yes. a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> Usually my day ends when the people come home. Right. Um, but a lot of the time I'll still be sitting here trying to jam something out and they're like all around and I'm just like, ah, and that's yeah. not a good way to end my day. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's the thing is like, that can be a decision. That's a boundary that you can set. You're free to yep. do that, Jamie. Yep. <laughs> and anybody listening, you can, you can do that. It's, it's not easy always. I'm not saying it's no. easy. Mm -mm. But that ability to choose what it is for you, that's always there. And it can look different from everyone's can be totally unique. That's the cool thing. But I love, I love that you brought it back to like, this is what we teach kids. We, yeah. often, we often like childhood, early childhood education has all of the core nuggets that we need pretty much, like really good stuff in there. And when we become adults, we're like, yeah, we don't need that anymore. Uh, I don't need boundaries. I don't need to know what my boundaries are, but this is all human. Like it makes us feel so much more secure and that enables us to then enjoy everything more and do better work. So mm -hmm. yeah, and it, and it, it, sets, it sets expectations. And when people are working within expectations, then everything's homeostasis. Exactly. You got awesome. it. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. This was great. I appreciate it. Hey y'all, thanks for listening. If you found this podcast to be inspiring, helpful, and entertaining, please like and subscribe. This helps us grow the community and reach more people. If you are interested in learning more about this episode's guests or accessing any of the books or other resources mentioned in this episode, be sure to check out the description box below. Until next time, be abundant.